Thank you for inviting me, uh, Tony and Sherry, and uh, this meeting's really been terrific so far. It's my first time attending, and uh, really, really wonderful talks, and enjoying the questions. Uh, what, what I've been asked to talk about today is the neuroimaging literature provide some sort of overview of what's been found, in particular what, how it might be relevant for our understanding of addictions. The last 15 to 20 years have been a particularly exciting period for those of us in the neuroimaging community. Um, it's been a period of developing a, a wide range of new tools that we can use, and these have improved Ah, good. These have improved uh, the resolution of our, our imaging methods at the anatomical level, temporal improvement resolution, and neurochemical resolution. Um, for those of us in the community, I, th I think we can feel justifiably quite pleased with ourselves, and sometimes we, we, we express that uh, uh, in, in rather proud terms. Um, but uh, a certain amount of caution is warranted also. And I think this uh, slide uh, provides a good example of at least some of the reasons why we need to be cautious uh, when looking at these beautiful images. So in this particular study, um, it was a uh, social perspective taking task using the tool fMRI, which in essence provides a measure of cerebral blood flow. And um, what you can see, there's a really quite nice and compelling uh, uh, effect occurring in the midline of this animal's brain, as well as a smaller effect in dorsal spinal cord. Um, this is a really quite compelling effect, the type of thing many people would like to see. Um, th there's an important problem, though, and that is the animal model being used here is the Atlantic salmon recently deceased. Um, <laughs> The authors reported this finding um, as a way to highlight, in a rather dramatic and amusing way, um, the importance to correct properly statistically for the huge number of statistical contrasts that are made in imaging studies. Now, I want to emphasize the neuroimaging literature is not more susceptible to reporting false positives than any other discipline, uh, but the complexity of the statistics that are employed um, can sometimes make it more difficult to judge whether you're looking at a good or a poor quality study. All right. Boom. So with, with that caveat, um, and we have to take some care when interpreting these findings, and the added complication that there often seems to be many contradictions within the literature, what would we like the uh, neuroimaging to tell us when we're thinking about addictions? What could it possibly tell us? Um, well, one, one thing I think we'd all like to, to see is some sort of cohesive integration of the findings, which findings have been found uh, repeatedly or well replicable, and how might we interpret them. Um, there's also imaging has a potential to uh, identify pre-existing risk factors for addictions, um, to identify these uh, elusive biomarkers that uh, might have play an important role uh, in development of addictions. And then finally, we'd be interested in whether any of the information obtained from uh, neuroimaging might actually be helpful uh, for treatment of uh, regimens, actually inform treatment decisions. So how much, how far have we gotten with, the, with the, uh, these questions? Well, first I'd like to start with what, what have really been some of the most consistent findings within the neuroimaging uh, literature. And a good place to start is with uh, a, a very important finding uh, by uh, Nora Volkov. I uh, mentioned earlier she's the director of NIDA in the U.S. Um, this is one of her most famous papers, reported in the, the mid-late uh, 90s, in which she used the method, the pet ractopride method. It provides an index of the availability of dopamine D2 receptors within the striatum. And what she reported was that compared to healthy controls, individuals with a long history of severe co cocaine dependence, these are near daily users for a decade, and really severe, severe cocaine dependent individuals show a significant reduction in the availability of D2 receptors um, within, within the striatum. Her own group alone has gone on to reproduce that effect across a wide range of uh, types of addictions, uh, and indeed, this is really one of the best replicated findings within biological psychiatry. Uh, really an impressive amount of, uh, of uh, consistency in this, in this literature. The one interesting exception are those individuals with cannabis use disorders. Um, there have been four studies that I know to date, and none of those have identified a change in these baseline uh, dopamine receptors within the striatum.
The second important finding from that study she reported in 97 was that when it's, Participants in the study were challenged with a surreptitious um, injection of, uh, of uh, methylphenidate. Um, there were none of the usual cues were available. It wasn't certainly wasn't like being in in, uh, in their usual environment for taking the drug. But when they were discreetly administered an intravenous injection of methylphenidate the, in the healthy control. Whoops! How do you go back? Oh, there we go. In the healthy controls, there is a clear change in the ractopride signal from the placebo to the drug test session, and it providing an index of increased dopamine release within the striatum. In the cocaine-dependent subjects, you can see again that they have lower baseline levels of the, tr of the tracer binding, lower striatal dopamine receptors, but almost no change whatsoever uh, following this um, surreptitious um, administration of methylphenidate. This finding, too, is proving to be highly replicable. The literature is smaller, reflecting in large part how much more challenging and difficult these kinds of studies are, um, but a really impressive record uh, at this point. Um, eight studies showing low dopamine release under these conditions in late-stage addicts. Um, no studies uh, showing a, a, an absence of distant difference, and no studies uh, showing the converse effect. Again, cannabis stands out as an, as an outlier in this literature. Um, there's only two studies to date, so it's a small sample to be talking about. Uh, but one of the studies found no difference in the dopamine release under these peculiar conditions. Um, a second study did find a difference, low dopamine release as in the other projects. But I think it's important to emphasize this was an unusual uh, study population, individuals with comorbid schizophrenia, and I think it raises an important issue that there may well be something really quite different about using cannabis um, in people who are susceptible to psychosis as compared to other populations. Third finding that's been seen really quite consistently within the neuroimaging literature is evidence of low cortical function um, in, in individuals with uh, various substance use disorders. Uh, this again comes from an early study from Nora Volkov's group um, in which she used a technique, um, fairly outdated now, not used so often, but essentially measuring uh, regional differences in uh, glucose metabolism using a glucose analog. Um, for comparison purposes, um, she also provided um, a glucose metabolism in a healthy heart. Here's a diseased heart. Here's a healthy brain. And here's the brain glucose metabolism in a long-term cocaine-dependent individual. Um, we see decreases in various areas. Um, this is unresting conditions, um, nothing really very interesting going on. Decreases throughout much of the brain, um, in particular within the frontal cortex. This too has proven to be um, a highly replicable finding um, using various uh, methods to measure a cortical function um, under these, again, conditions of nothing very interesting going on or uh, certainly nothing very drug-related going on, low cortical function in people with long-term substance-dependent uh, uh, histories. The one standout, the one um, condition in which where this is not seen is when individuals are exposed to drug-related cues. And Tony mentioned this, how the presence versus absence of drug-related cues can have really quite profound effects on uh, brain, uh, brain transmission and behavioral responses. Uh, and I'll be discussing a bit more of that as, as the talk moves on. Um, this effect of cues to activate various parts of the brain has been really quite pronounced. Um, it's been seen in a large number of studies, and two recent meta-analyses both came to the same conclusions, um, that a number of brain regions really very consistently show responses, quite profound responses, to drug-related cues when the, the, they're shown to individuals with long histories of substance abuse problems. And these effects, as you might expect, are much larger than what you you would see when you show drug cues to a non-drug user. Not really a surprising finding. What's interesting really are the specific areas that come up, um, the most consistent being the orbital frontal cortex and other aspects of limbic cortex, the amygdala, and the ventral striatum. That aspect of striatum that in the rodent literature we'd usually call nucleus accumbens. <laughs> 
When we expose individuals with a long history of substance use problems, we can, uh, when we expose them to drug-related cues, it's also been now a well-replicated finding, at least within four studies, including one from my own group, that we see drug in, or drug cue-induced um, dopamine release within the, within the stratum of individuals um, uh, with the histories of substance dependence. Um, individual differences in the magnitude of this cue-induced dopamine response correlates with craving, and this also was seen in all four of these studies. Um, a really quite consistent effect, a relatively small literature, but all four studies, um, mostly done in cocaine-dependent individuals, one in heroin, heroin addicts. Very similar uh, findings across, uh, across these studies. So, in summary, um, th there have been three very consistent findings seen in individuals in late stage uh, addiction. One, that they have low cortical activity um, and low dopamine activity, at least when at rest and in the absence of drug related cues. Um, but there is high cortical activity and high dopamine activity when indiv these individuals are tested in the presence of drug-related cues. And these, these are important um, distinctions to make. Um, obviously, usually when people are taking drugs, there are cues present. So these are non-trivial differences. And of course, when they're not drugs present, um, brain function in these limbic systems might be actively inhibited. And it's thought that this might play an important role in the very selective um, narrowing of interests. It's really quite uh, a hallmark of addiction problems. The next question of interest then, are these things, of these differences that we've seen in the brain of long-term addicts, is there any evidence that some of these might actually be pre-existing vulnerability traits? Um, or are they the, the primarily the function of long-term exposure to the drug. This is a smaller uh, literature to date and a much more difficult and challenging question to get at, um, but preliminary attempts have been made. Um, some of the best replicated findings um, uh, uh, are the ones that I'll be showing you over the next few slides. So for example, when we think about when we want to look at um, reward system responses in individuals at risk for, for addictions, we can go about this in uh, a number of different ways. Certainly one way to talk about high-risk individuals in a very general sense is just to talk about in, in terms of demographics. Um, teens are, of course, at much higher risk than uh, both younger and older groups um, to use and abuse uh, various substances. In fact, in a culture such as ours, um, alcohol and illicit drug use, at least a little bit of it, is, has become the norm. Um, these are very common features. Teenagers also show exaggerated limbic system responses, particularly within this ventral striatum area, and in response to a variety of very simple reward-related cues, happy faces, um, uh, winning money, and so on. Individual differences in the magnitude of these simple reward-induced responses within the limbic striatum correlate quite well and are predictive of various risk-taking uh, behaviors. And this is uh, seen across these different age groups. Um, this is a more generic, uh, general, general association. We also see similar effects when we actually look at people who started to abuse substances. These are mostly non-dependent um, uh, alcohol drinkers, but have quite heavy social drinkers, the way they are described. The paradigm, I think, is really quite interesting. In essence, there's a tube in the mouth that sprays um, uh, small quantities of each individual's favorite preferred alcoholic beverage, and that's compared to a, a fruit juice. What you can see is that the alcohol taste produces larger effects in this exact same cortical striatal, thalamic cortical circuit that I referred to earlier, limbic cortex, limbic striatum, um, being potently activated by these alcohol cues um, in these heavy social drinkers. And the greater um, the effect of these cues on this limbic system, the greater their alcohol use problems. And this association was seen in all of these um, same brain regions um, that I've been referring to repeatedly. Um, we've also seen evidence that it's not just a change in response to the cues that is important, but the repeated exposure to the drug can actually change response to the drug itself. And uh, uh, Tony referred, gosh, I associate Tony so much with dopamine research, I, I, I literally called him dopamine. <laughs> and dopamine just told you about. 
<laughs> that's it, that's it. <gasps> Tony told you about how repeated drug exposure can lead to a progressive increase in behavioral responses to addictive drugs. There's evidence in really quite a strong literature on how this is associated with changes in dopamine and glutamate transmission. Whether this actually occurs in humans, though, has been much more controversial uh, until recently, uh, though we re very re recently in this paper um, provided the first evidence that it was indeed occurring in humans. These individuals, um, as you're perhaps hoping, were not at high risk for addictions. We, we, um, they were carefully selected not to be, though they were high novelty seekers and recruited on that basis. And we then exposed them to a repeated amphetamine regimen. And what this panel is essentially showing is that with successive doses of amphetamine given uh, on an intermittent schedule, the dopamine response within the stratum became progressively larger and larger. Here's the response to their first dose of amphetamine. Um, the brighter pixels, really just the way we depict information in these studies, um, reflecting the larger dopamine response to the fourth dose, and then an even bigger response to the fifth dose. As Tony mentioned, these are very long-lasting effects. This fifth dose was actually given a full year after um, the preceding uh, 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 amphetamine regimen. All right, to push this idea even further, um, we then rec we now we recruited a group of individuals who genuinely were at risk for addictions, um, in particular alcohol use disorders. And here, we, what the, we gave them was not amphetamine, but was a, 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 um, a, a big drink of, their, of, 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 of actual alcohol, which is to say the uh, usual cues are present. They were drinking the alcohol just like they normally would. It looked like alcohol, it smelled like alcohol, it tasted like alcohol, it was alcohol. Um, and sure enough, the high-risk individuals, those at a risk for, for alcoholism based on various um, uh, features, um, showed a robust dopamine response um, uh, within this striatum, particularly within this ventral limbic region. The response in the low-risk individuals was so small that actually it was, it was sub-threshold. We couldn't even detect a dopamine response in these uh, low-risk individuals. Uh, similarly, individuals recruited that specifically at being at risk for, for addictions, in this case based on having a family history of substance use disorders, also show um, uh, differential responses to uh, uh, drug-related cues. What's curious though is that when they're exposed to non-drug-related cues, they're now showing this opposite effect. They're showing a diminished response to non-drug-related cues. We've also seen evidence that, we, that there can be small dopamine responses um, in individuals at risk for addictions when the cues are absence. I'm really getting out of this phenomenon that Tony referred to earlier, the occasion setting properties of drug-related cues or cues that have been paired with the absence of the drug, suggesting that these reward systems can be actively augmented and actively inhibited depending on the context the circumstances. So in this particular study where we challenged high-risk individuals with a dose of amphetamine given in a hidden capsule, not looking anything like the usual uh, uh, amphetamines that they might use on the street, now we're seeing a much smaller dopamine response as compared to uh, healthy controls receiving their very first uh, exposure to amphetamine. Uh, this was partially driven by their experience with uh, past drug use, so there are correlations with the amount of past drug use and the magnitude of the dopamine response, but that was not a sufficient explanation. And we say that confidently, both by doing some fancy statistics, but even more importantly, we had this additional control group here. These were individuals with a personal history of substance use matched exactly to the high-risk individuals. Um, but without a family history of substance use problems. And what you can see is that they had a much larger dopamine response than the high-risk individuals, raising the possibility that these perhaps context-related, cue-related inhibitions of the dopamine system under these sort of circumstances um, are much more pronounced in individuals at risk for addictions. So 
Based on these observations, I've proposed a number of times over the last few years, um, uh, uh, speculative, but I think there's more and more evidence in favor of this model of addiction's vulnerability. In essence, the proposition is that before drug use begins, many, perhaps even most, high-risk individuals have increased reward circuit responses to a wide range of rewards, predisposing them to various risk-taking, impulsive um, uh, behaviors. Once drug use begins, though, this reward circuit activation can become tied to the drug-related cues. The system is potently turned on when the cues are present, which is the usual conditions when someone is taking a drug, but in the absence of those cues, the system is potently inhibited. And again, this may well account for the progressive narrowing of interests, why drugs can start to seem so very interesting and motivate behavior, and other things will become less motivating. The last question that we've been trying, and I'm using being the royal we um, as a community, um, we've been trying to address in the neuroimaging literature is whether any markers can be identified that are, have implications for, uh, for treatment responsivity. Um, if I'd given this presentation two years ago, I'd have to say, sorry, not yet. But in the last two years, two very similar studies have been reported with, I think, really very intriguing findings. They both used really quite similar methods, this pet racropide method to measure both baseline D2 receptors in the striatum and the dopamine response when given to, um, a, again, a surreptitiously hidden um, a, a dose of, a dose of a methylphenidate. Uh, Afterward, subject, the participants were then brought into treatment regimens and the, the, people, the investigators looked at whether the dopamine features predicted the response to treatment. What they found were two main effects. First of all, those individuals who did not respond to the treatment regimen had lower D2 receptors, baseline levels of D2 receptors within the striatum um, as compared to the responders. Even more profound, this in inhibition of the dopamine response under these conditions where people are tested without cues was only seen in individuals who did not respond to the behavioral treatment. The behavioral treatment, by the way, was a combination of social support, social rewards, and contingency management therapy, where individuals are essentially paid um, relatively modest amounts of money, but paid money to provide clean urine samples and to stay, stay uh, drug-free. What's interesting, the point to emphasize again, though, is that the individual, whoops, the individuals who responded to this therapy were actually able to still mount a dopamine response even in the absence of drug-related cues. And I think it raises the interesting possibility, well, two things. First, that there are multiple pathways to addictions, um, that only some of them develop this inhibited dopamine response in the absence of drug-related cues. Other individuals can still mount a dopamine response even if there aren't drug-related cues around. And those individuals might retain the ability to learn new reward-related behaviors, and they might be particularly um, well-suited to things like continuously management therapies. So finally, um, in conclusion and to summarize these uh, main findings, combined with this somewhat speculative integration interpretation of what they mean. Um, the proposal is that before drug use starts, high-risk individuals, many of them at least, perhaps most, have increased reward circuit responses to many rewards, and this influences a wide range of impulsive risk-taking behaviors. Once drug use starts, though, this reward circuit activation can become tied to the drug-related cues. In individuals with current addictions, they can reach the point where many of them will exhibit high dopamine frontal striatal circuit activity only when the drug cues are present, whereas in other circumstances, they're in a low um, reward system uh, functioning state. Those who retain the ability to activate their dopamine reward circuitries in the absence of drug-related cues um, can more easily develop reward-related behaviors and might be good candidates for contingency management and similar types of therapies. Those who lose their ability to activate their dopamine reward system in the absence of drug cues, though, might require something quite different. Thank you. <laughs>